Okay, Doug. So I'm sat here today with the lovely Jeffrey Pierce. Most people <laughs> may know this young man as Tommy from The Last of Us. And he, did you know this man is also an author? Tell us a bit like, <laughs> that's just such yes. a random way to announce it. <laughs> it's perfect. Um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, uh, <laughs> young man. I was a young man when we started making The Last of Us like 10 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't feel quite as young anymore, but I guess I don't feel that much older either. Um, I, yeah, I, I, uh, I, I started writing uh, novels uh, three years ago. Okay. So what yeah. kind of came about with that? Did, was it just one day where like, I've always had like a passion for writing or just something I thought, oh, well, I have this idea. Maybe I can do something with this. Uh, I wish it had been that sort of simple a process. Um, one of the first things that I ever did was, uh, was write. I wrote uh, when I was first in Los Angeles in 1996, wow. which is a very long time ago at this point. Wow, before I was born anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Um, yes. Uh, so I, I, I wrote a, I wrote a script uh, and uh, I was having a very hard time getting doors open as an actor because it's a tough town. Um, yeah. But I, uh, I sort of did a guerrilla warfare campaign to get people to read uh, the script that I wrote. And uh, I was really lucky that a guy named Mark Gill, who was Miramax at the time, read it and uh, appreciated it and we had uh lunch and he gave me some notes on it and uh gave me some praise and it was lovely and it uh opened ended up opening a lot of doors um i got my uh first agent that way and then he became my manager after that and it's it began my entire career as an actor uh ironically and i found that acting was a much easier way to make a living than writing was <laughs> oh, okay um and so uh, I leaned on that for, for a good long time. And then I realized that I didn't want to tell uh, stories of my own at some point instead of just showing up and telling other people's stories. So I started writing again. Um, and a friend and I sold the script to Fox five or six years ago. And uh, after that, uh, I realized that I wanted to tell this particular story. Um, and so I started writing. I realized that the only way to make it real, because the concept is so large, is to make it into something that had a, uh, uh, hopefully, eventually some sort of following in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, but that you tell the story from start to finish so that you can say, this is what exists. And it, it is, uh, uh, it's real. It's not just an idea. Um, and then hopefully it becomes something else. Or it just is a series of books that I get to the end of and, and, and uh, keep going. Yeah. Well, I, I like how, now I'm a bit of a history buff. So when I saw that it, it was kind of like the World War One era basis. I got really mm. excited because it's like, yeah. it's, that's this kind of stuff I learned about history at school. And I really liked that kind of stuff. So was that a kind of concept that you always want to go with? Or was there something else that you had in mind? Yeah. I mean, the, the script that I wrote in 1996 was a World War One drama uh, that had a very unhappy ending, <laughs> but it was straight history. Uh, it was not, it was, uh, you know, just a dramatic story of these two men who were fighting on the front lines. Um, and it's not, you know, it's interesting because in Europe, uh, a lot of attention is paid to that war in the United States, not so much. Uh, it's sort of taught as, uh, there was this war in Europe and then we went in and kicked everybody's ass and won and hooray America. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And which is not really the story of that war. Um, and so I wanted to try to find a way to tell that story in a way that could be compelling to a much broader audience than just people interested in history. And I had been looking back at some, you know, history books about the First World War and had a dream uh, that it was a uh, sort of a, end of times world war one experience and woke up and thought oh shit that's that's the book that's the story wow. that the hook for an audience is not necessarily going to be we're going to take a look uh, a journey into history but we're going to look at this from a paranormal uh uh spiritual uh uh end of times sort of uh, uh view 
So yeah, it, history is an important part of it. And I think, you know, having read the second book, you know that we get uh, deeper and deeper into different pieces of history as we mm. go. I, I like that you had the paranormal aspect as well. I think it's kind of more, it more grips you and I think it lets your imagination run a little bit. I imagine you're one that has like an enormous imagination. <laughs> Has that always, <laughs> have you always had like a really big brain? Like, oh, like maybe I could do this or that. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I think that I've been lucky to, I've been lucky in a million ways. Um, I think that number one, lucky to have parents who uh, trusted that my gut instinct for what was going to make me happy and what I was going to pursue was okay. There was never any pressure to be like, well, you should be a doctor, you should be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. um, I knew what I wanted to be from a young age and, and, and sort of chose accordingly. Um, and, uh, and so nothing sort of in my personal world was stopping me from saying, I can do this, I can be that. Mm -hmm. And I don't, we're in a very important moment in history where... Yes. People who look like me have to take a look really hard and realize that a lot of the barriers that other people will face in their process did not exist for me. That my struggle may have been real to me, but my struggle was not as difficult as it would have been had I been a black man or a Latina man mm -hmm. or a woman or gay or trans or, or anything. And so uh, I think that, I don't know, maybe over the past 10 years, coming to terms with that and coming to uh, uh, see the reality of that situation has, has colored my sort of pride in, in, in what I've accomplished. Not to say that I'm not proud of what I've done, mm -hmm. but I'm aware that barriers that exist for other people did not exist for me. And, uh, and so I tried to, in my storytelling, to rectify that a little bit by having as broad a coalition of voices within the storytelling as possible. I like that. Um, so I was. So you had a. Have you had a lot of barriers recently with um, COVID? Have you had something <laughs> like? I think that's an answer. Everyone's going to say, "Well, yes, of course." But um, oh I mean, yeah. Like, did you do you have like a studio set up in your house so like it's not as hard or? I do, but uh, uh, it, it is. Uh, it's also functionally difficult because I'm I'm in Georgia. I bought a house in Atlanta like six years ago. So I've been commuting back and forth up until COVID, just going, you know, wherever work would take me. And 2020 was tough because work did not want to take anybody anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> and so it, it was a, it was a, on the, on the one hand, I, I got a complete second book written and, uh, and recorded. So that was nice. Uh, but it was a, it was a year of, of sort of like balance and struggle mm -hmm. and, and figuring out, okay, what comes next um and fortunately it feels like knock on wood we're we're on the other side of covid yeah. and personally I, I, things are starting to to get into motion again um you know work-wise which is nice yeah <laughs> uh, i want to say a huge congratulations to all of your awards for your book that's absolutely insane they just started announcing them on twitter and i was like oh another one another one another one <laughs> yeah it was uh, it was it was it was a really pleasant surprise. Um, you write in a bubble and you can't write for everybody. And it's not my expectation that everyone is gonna fall in love with my writing, the style or the story or the characters or anything. Um, and so I think essentially you write to please yourself. Yeah. And it's really nice when other people <laughs> are pleased in the same way that, it, you know, that they're affected in the same way that your writing affects you. Um, that, but I, I try not to, I, don't know, I, I find that it's dangerous to look for too much approval from the outside. So uh, I, I had no anticipation uh, that I was going to win the, those Hoffer Awards, but man, it felt great when it happened. I had yeah. no anticipation that I was going to get nominated for a BAFTA for Tommy. And I was about to go too. with that as well. <laughs> You know, so when it happened, it's great. And but it didn't matter to me. I, I mean, it was nice to not care if I won or not. It was yeah. like just like I, I can't look at the the other men and women who are nominated in that category and not think, Jesus, how did 
how do you pick a best out of that group yeah. of people? Uh, it's just like everybody's like did a perfect job for what they were slated to do. So I'm not sure where you sort of like decide, well, this was by far the top performance. Yeah. Um, it's a weird uh, metric, but I guess that, that, that uh, you know, it, it is what it is. I was, I was so excited when you were nominated because I was just like, yes, this is such a good character. Why didn't you get any kind of praise before? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's just so much in the story that's so good. It's hard to see. Yeah. Like, how do you say, well, I look at the performances in, in both of those games and think we're just all like, shoot, you know, hitting par. Like, it's just like there's not a moment, uh, a false note in that piece. Um, yeah. so, you know, how do you separate out, you know, what, what shines in that? I mean, obviously, uh, uh, Troy and Ashley, uh, <laughs> like gleaming diamonds in that story, but everybody is doing their part. It's really exciting to have been a part of something that is that well executed and so rare. <laughs> Were you prepared for just how big of a role Tommy was going to play in part two? Uh, Neil and I had spoken at length about what the story was going to be. He, he, he made clear to me what the journey was. Um, and I, I mean, I, he, he is a, a definitely a pivotal part, but I always feel like I'm just coming in like, you know, just helping the, the ship move along to the best of my ability. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not flying the plane. Um, yeah. I always feel like I'm, I am a passenger in really, really good hands when I show up and, 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 and work on that set yeah uh i just every time i try not to talk about like the last of us all the time because i always end up talking to somebody random about it like i had an interview yesterday with somebody completely unrelated to the last of us and we ended up talking about it for a good 10 minutes uh, <laughs> yeah it's it um, is it is i don't know i mean i think you always hope that you're going to be a part of something that is culturally impactful and I've done a lot of television and, uh, you know, a fair amount of film and a, and a handful of, of really well done games. But in terms of having a cultural imprint, uh, nothing I've done has had the impact uh, that The Last of Us has. I said this to somebody else recently that I, I'm not I like I'm, well, I am a really emotional person but I don't ever feel so emotional like a film or a book or something but I think with a game because you're in the shoes of that character going for all the stuff around you like it was just a huge hit mm. and I love that I I love just how the emotions hit me in that game even though I probably need therapy after it but <laughs> <laughs> well I, I don't I don't think that anybody had done a game to that point that the goal was for the uh, the player to feel and be empathetic in the experience. Um, and to, the goal was to be moved, to move you in, on a, in a dramatic fashion, um, the way that cinema does, that really great cinema does. Um, and we're in an interesting time where they're not making a lot of movies that are supposed to punch you in the gut like that. Um, <laughs> You know, as, as wonderful as the Marvel movies are, they are not designed to be the height of storytelling art. Mm. Um, they move you in visceral ways, but it's not, uh, I don't know, I mean, I look at the movies that I watched as a kid from the 70s and even into the 80s and like, you know, The Godfather and Taxi Driver and The Mission and uh, 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 Shawshank Redemption and these movies that really just take you for a purposeful ride emotionally. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think that, that The Last of Us filled a void and gave a generation an experience uh, that cinema used to give <laughs> my, my generation. Yeah. How, obviously, I think it's more Troy and Ashley they'll have these people kind of walking up to them, but have you ever, or how do you feel if somebody would walk up to you and say, this means so much to me and this is what this character has done for me? How does that make you feel? Uh, it, it, it makes me feel great. Uh, I was at uh, a hardware store, I don't know, probably six months ago, middle pandemic and had a mask on everything. And, you know, nobody, nobody around here knows who I am, <laughs> which is great. 
Uh, it's, it's lovely to be anonymous, uh, but I had my The Last of Us sweatshirt on and a kid working at the hardware store was like, hey, I, that game is so awesome with no sort of cognition on his part that I was involved in it. And I wasn't going to be like, well, you know, I Did have you know? <laughs> I was like, I just said, yeah, isn't it amazing? And we had a great connection on the game, not on my role on it. So it was so genuine and so uh, uh, heartfelt. It was really, really uh, a, a cool experience. So I love that. I love that people are affected like that by the game. When I meet yeah. young actors now, uh, they don't know me from what I've done. They know me from The Last of Us. Yes. Um, I remember even when I met Robbie Amell, I was playing his father on The Tomorrow People. <laughs> he came running up. He's like, oh, my God, you were Tommy in The Last of Us. And it was it was a shock to me in the moment. Um, but, it, yeah, it's, it's a wonderful feeling. Yeah. Um. I don't know where I was going to go with that there, but um, would you, have you been to many cons? I feel like I've never really asked anyone that question. I have not. Uh, you know, I, I think the times that, that I have looked into it and, and pursued it, but I mean, it's, you know, uh, when, you, when you're <laughs> raising a kid and uh, pursuing your career, sometimes it's hard to, to focus on things that feel like they might be tangential to what you do. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think until The Last of Us Part Two came out, uh, I was probably not going to be at the top of the list of like, hey, we got to get this guy to a convention. Um, and so it's not something that I've ever pursued, but not through any sort of sense of I don't want to do that or that's not something that makes sense to me. It's just a question of timing. Um, and then 2020 was not a great year for conventions. <laughs> no. <laughs> so it wasn't a great way to get into that world. Uh, but I'm looking forward to, I think, as the year progresses, as Europe starts to open back up again, mm -hmm. to, uh, to making sure that I can uh, do that and be a part of that world. Because it's exciting to be able to engage with people who are, you know, uh, fans of, 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 the, of The Last of Us in particular. Um, mm -hmm. It's, a, it's been, I think, a powerful story for a lot of people. Yeah. So for most people who don't know, there, you have a book signing coming up. Is it next yes. week after? Uh, well, uh, the, the book comes out on the 24th. So I'm going to do uh, uh, selling the book, uh, signed copies of the book until then. Then I have to order the books and that'll take about two weeks for them to get to me. And then I'll do the Instagram live signing. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, because I <laughs> I was going to order them on like Amazon, but I couldn't remember. I couldn't remember if it were on just the US one or the UK, but I was kind of like, well, I'll leave it. And then you sent me the one to read for the second one. But I kind of thought I couldn't read it on my phone very well. So I was like, okay, I'll listen to the audio book. And then you've announced these. And I was like, oh, why didn't I just do this? That's a good <laughs> idea. <laughs> <laughs> did you did you get to listen to the audiobook i listened to parts of it i hadn't listened to it the whole way through i really yeah. liked that you decided to do a british accent of it. it was really good that was uh probably the riskiest choice that i made uh going in um but it just you sometimes you just have to listen to that instinct and follow it uh, uh <laughs> if it had not worked it would have been tragic yeah <laughs> it um, probably would be like very like monty python-esque or something like oh that oh god yeah yeah uh, <laughs> uh, i certainly had a, a handful of days where i was like mm, is this a good idea but i don't know you listen for that sort of uh voice in the back of your head that's telling you to take a risk as an actor or as a writer and uh, i think that over time you come to trust that that voice is right nine times out of ten um, you know, you, you, you know, no, you generally, that, that voice that, that you recognize as, as like the muse, uh, you got to run with it. Otherwise it will go away. Mm -hmm. Oh, for me with my writing, I feel like there's always a demon behind me. <laughs> like, no, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. I'm like, no, nope, I like it. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah. Yeah. Don't, don't listen to the demon. Um, I, I write in a very particular way, uh, I had read about all these novelists in the uh, 1800s and, and they would 
they called it a second sleep. And what they would do is wake up in the middle of the night and they would write and then they would sleep a second time and they would get up and they would edit. And functionally what happens when you wake up in the morning is the creative side of your brain is awake the second the alarm goes off. And it takes about an hour and a half, two hours for the critical thinking of your brain to wake up. And so Mm -hmm. what I've found is that if I get up in the morning and have coffee and start writing immediately, that critical thinking isn't working. And all you can do is just get clay and put it on the wheel. And as soon as I start to criticize what I'm doing, I realize that the other half of my brain is woken up and I stop and I go back and I edit what I've done because the critical thinking brain is very good at pointing out, you know, things that could be better, but if it's doing it while you're trying to create, you're fucked. Yeah. And that's probably my problem. I'm always like writing something down and in my head, I'm like, I know this is good. And then that's when it starts to come with that. No, it's not. (laughs) <laughs> yeah like, yeah you're like, wait until i write it and then you can criticize it, we'll fix yeah. it. You're like you you, you can because you can use it to your advantage you go back and use that critical part to bring it up to sort of like uh, uh as high a level of excellence as you can but mm-hmm. if you're trying to create at the same time as you're trying to destroy it you just end up you know wanting to blow your brains out <laughs> I've noticed like the story that I was telling you about that I'm thinking about writing like I'm still at the very beginning of it because I know where I want it to go but it's just starting it that I'm having the trouble with I'm just I don't know how to start it I know probably how it's going to end but the first yeah yeah I mean I I think you just have to to spit it all out the good the bad and the ugly let the editing happen later just like write it badly write it really like focus on this is going to be terrible yeah. But once you've created it, you can make it into anything. I mean, I don't do this, but I, I know that <laughs> I remember reading uh, Philip Roth said he writes 100 pages for every one that he ends up with. And I remember hearing that before I was writing and I was like, well, that sucks. That sounds terrible. But the idea of it is correct. Like you just have to be able to put, you know, let, let your creative side run. Mm-hmm. And then you figure out what works after that. Because there's nothing wrong with it being bad the first time or the second time or the third time, because there's always an opportunity to go and fix it, especially when it's a novel. Mm -hmm. Well, now that you've given me advice on that, um, do you have advice for any upcoming writers? Um, Man, Uh, I feel like an upcoming writer myself most of the time. Uh, I think that you have to read a lot. You have to read as much as you can. Find the genres and the authors that move you, that you read and think that is just beautiful. And uh, try to understand how they got there. Um, And then throw it all away and just create and don't create a sort of bar, you know. You need to understand technically how drama works and how it flows and like those things, but you need to forget them as you write. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think that the writer just has to write and then you figure out how to get good over the course of it. I'm, I'm glad no one is reading the first attack on any, <laughs> anything that I wrote. And I often make the mistake of sending stuff to friends too early. But, I, but now I've like yeah. narrowed that group of friends really to a very small number. <laughs> and I send the bits and pieces that I'm proud of and say, look, I just need to see if this works. Uh, and then I won't send them anything again for six months um, because you go back and you reread something that you've sent and you think, ah, shit, I missed these moments. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, you have to be sort of judicious with sharing, although the sharing is this most satisfying part of the journey. Oh, yeah. I feel like that's kind of similar with acting. I asked George Park, who plays Arthur Morgan in Red Dead, um, like what advice you'd have for an actor. And he was actually just said, read everything. Mm, find yeah. every play you can find read it and get into it and I just I like that that's a really huge similarity between the two yeah I think that the same thing is absolutely true I mean I think it's true for any art form devour mm. what people have done before you uh, mm. emulate it and then you find your own what works for you on that journey um, yeah. you know and and 
there is nothing I would like more than to be a part of like a writer's group, like to get together with other writers and bullshit about, you know, what you're going through. Um, because that's a wonderful part of being an actor. The only problems there are what I've, uh, uh, the first person who ever mentored me as a writer said, look, talking about writing and writing are the exact opposite. Mm -hmm. If you're talking about it, you're not doing it and you're wasting creative energy that would be better put in the actual writing. Mm -hmm. And the same is true of acting that, that it's important to, you know, have people to talk about, look for mutual experiences with, but the most important thing is do it, get in the mm -hmm. ring and, and do it. Whether that's, you know, doing monologues and figuring out how to make them work or getting together with a group and doing a play. I mean, like, it's in the action, not in the thinking about it or talking about it, but that's where life exists. Yeah, I, I find that I like how writing, even if it's fictional, can emulate real life. Because I remember uh, when I, I was actually at acting college for a little bit and we read The Crucible. Mm. And I think that's a prime example of like an incredible play just emulating real life. And I just, I love it. I just love how it could work in any kind of, any book, any genre, any play, anything. It just works out for the better. Yeah, well, Arthur Miller is, is fantastic. He's putting his life into everything that he does. Yeah, um, literally. Yeah, it is. Uh, so to be able to take, uh, you know, that piece, which is a period piece, but that, you know, he, he's putting his world into that experience. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that those moments are the most powerful moments that you can lean on as an actor or as a writer or as any type of artist is I'm putting myself into my work. Um, my, my dear friend, uh, Jai, who does all the chapter art in the books is extraordinary. Um, and his art comes from a place uh, uh, he, he was abused as a kid and it took him a long time to come to terms with that. And we didn't know that when we were teenagers growing up, what had occurred, but as he came to sort of grips with it, it, uh, it could have killed him. And instead he has turned it into a successful career as a visual, uh, you know, painter, uh, artist, illustrator. And without a sort of place to put that energy uh, it would have ended up very self-destructive for him. So yeah. I think that that's where they sort of, you know, a crucible for art is your life itself. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it's an interesting journey for sure. Yeah, um, like with me, I I think I've talked to Troy a lot about this and it's like um, never to be ashamed to share like your personal story and put it into mm. whatever you're doing. And um you know, I do that all the time. And when people say you're being too personal, I'm like, well, am I? Who's it going to help? Who's it going to hurt? Who's yeah. going to help? Well, it's going to probably help a lot of people more than it'll hurt somebody. Yeah. Um, yeah. And again, with The Last of Us and its story, it made me realize a lot of things about myself. Like um, for, you probably have read my Joel piece um, on my blog and it was very much the fact that I never really had a father figure growing up I've had a, I have a father I have a relationship with him but it's not anything like Joel would have been mm. if that makes sense sure and I, yeah I kind of just like it made me realize that this is something true about me and it's good that games can do that like it's it's not just here's a cut scene here's what you have to do next it's kind of like you can focus into that and you can put yourself into I get into that person's shoes yeah. and say, well, this can really impact me as well. I mean, I think that that is the basic importance of art is our ability to see ourselves and see each other because of it. Uh, mm -hmm. And the more open and honest an artist is with what they're creating, the more impactful it's going to be on an audience because they're going to recognize it as the truth. Um, and that's where, we're, you know, Art has become commerce driven because that's the basis of our society and everybody's making a shitload of money off of, you know, things that are maybe not good, but they, you know, they trigger enough things inside of the audience that the people want yes. to come back and have an experience. Mm -hmm. But the basic root of storytelling goes back to, you know, the, the campfire and then the amphitheater and for the Greeks and the Romans, 
where you would go to see the stories of your culture told so you would know how to be in the world. Um, and the Greek myth myths and, and you know, all sort of uh, uh, philosophies and religions that grew out of the sort of cultural experience of that were about saying, okay, this is how we live together as human beings, or this is how we're gonna die together. Um, and, and so I think it's really healthy that a game like The Last of Us comes along and makes so much fucking money for Sony that they have to make a sequel. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and it raises the bar for uh, other storytellers in the medium and says, this is what's possible. If you're not doing this, then you're just making games. But you can mm -hmm. choose to make something that is culturally powerful and maybe more powerful because the player is inside of the experience. And so hopefully the combination of the financial success of The Last of Us and the critical success of it means that the next generation of storytellers will say, I wanna be Neil Druckmann. I wanna have that <laughs> impact in the world. I wanna make that kind of storytelling what I do. And I wanna tell stories that are so personal to me that they change the way people think about each other. Because that's, where else are we gonna get our education about how to be as people? We're not getting it yeah. in schools. We're not getting it, you know, getting strange versions in, you know, a million different churches and synagogues and mosques that separate us more than they unite us. Uh, but story is designed to bring us together. And I hope that storytellers in video games continue to go down that road and say, look how much money The Last of Us made because it took these risks. Let's do the mm -hmm. same thing. Um, it's like I, I still hear the, the debate all the time about game violence and things like that. And I'm like, so do you, did you focus on the story? Did you listen to this? Like, I just, I hate that that's the one thing that especially the media seems to focus on all the time, where there's, there is a meaningful, impactful story and there is other things behind it. It's not just, oh, I shot this person with a friggin' flame water for no reason. <laughs> well, it, it is a, uh... And <laughs> the media, it's interesting that the same media that criticizes violence in video games loves to sort of lead with all the bad news. Like, yes. if it bleeds, it leads. Like, you know, if there's violence and something terrible happened, we're going to lead with it. Um, as opposed to, you know, it, when art is done well, the violence will make you walk away not real happy about it. I mean, mm -hmm. I don't think anybody... <laughs> plays The Last of Us and doesn't like have moments of, oh God, I, I really have to kill this person too? I have to kill this dog? Uh, yeah. And sort of like this sort of, uh, th there is an experiential nature to it that doesn't numb you to violence. Yeah. Or put it into a place of like how glorious all this killing is. Um, so I, I think it comes down to what the intent of the artist is behind it. I mean, mm -hmm. my books are, violent as hell but i don't think that at any point uh that the, that there can be a sort of like oh well isn't that cool <laughs> yeah so it's gonna bring a revolver or something into school <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah i don't think it's gonna inspire that <laughs> but i don't think that i i don't think the video games would inspire these kids to to do mass shootings i don't think that they're no you know no. they may find uh uh yeah that the, the problems are what about the fucking parents? You yeah. know, where are the parents of these kids? Where is the engagement in these kids' lives? Where is someone saying, okay, something's going on here and we need to talk. I love yeah. you. Let's figure out what the problem is. Yeah. I don't think that, you know, uh, you know, do you blame the parents? Yeah, fuck, you blame the parents because who else are you going to blame? Yeah. If there's... the kid has a problem and no, and everyone ignored it. The problem is yeah. the fucking parents uh, yeah. and it's access to guns. And it is, you know, all that stupidity that goes along with it. But it starts with where are mom and dad, you mm -hmm. know, or grandparents or the neighbor, everybody, you know, like who's stepping in to touch these kids and find out and say, look, what's going on? Um, yeah. You know, it's, I feel uh, like yes, the it ain't it ain't video games. <laughs> With every situation, there's always intervention. There's got to be. I think with me especially, I've had a lot of mental health issues. And even when I've not spoken to people about it, they can see it and they can say, are you okay? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And I can just go like, yeah, or no, I'm absolutely breaking down. Of course, I'm not okay. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, the courage to be able to recognize vulnerability in yourself is important. But, you know, it, it is, uh, you have to have people around you who are willing to have the courage to ask those questions. Yeah, I feel like as well that schools really need to be more educated in that kind of thing because the amount of times I've gone into a guidance counselor and explained them how I felt, they've just not understood. And I'm like, are you not trained in this? Do you not know anything about this? It's... Yeah. I, I think that, yeah, I didn't get a lot of guidance from my guidance counselors <laughs> in high school at all. Uh, they all thought I should not pursue a career in acting for sure. <laughs> um yeah, it is. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think that when we stop sort of like pointing fingers outside, looking for the responsibility in, in our sort of connection to each other as human beings and start to really just focus on connecting, uh, we can solve some of our problems. Um, but yeah, ignoring it, pretending it's not there, that is not the way. Yeah, I, I've i always been guilty of being a bottler. I've always yeah. been one that's like hid my feelings and then like it just gets to the point where I've done something silly or I've broken down or something. That's probably yeah. why I share my story a bit more than I should, but I think not only does it help me, but it'll probably help somebody else. The courage to say it out loud is, is everything because everyone can relate. Uh, there's nobody out there who's sort of like walking around bulletproof, not looking for solutions to how they feel solutions to how they go about their day um the this you know troy uh uh turned me on to uh marcus aurelius and yes. the Stoic philosophy which is lovely i mean it's you look back and like he's and, turned everyone to that <laughs> yes it is uh you know you look at these uh these guys thousands of years ago who were looking for answers to why how do i feel good how do I get my head together to live well and to have a good life and to live it with joy and do good things and be a good person and handle how I feel? Uh, we have been, I think, struggling with these issues for 100,000 years, I'm sure. Uh, and so to, to see it sort of uh, uh, written down um, very thoughtfully and very carefully and approached in a methodical way by these these people and be able to apply it today just as they applied it back then is is pretty exceptional yeah i i also applaud you like the i obviously i was shocked that you followed me like when i asked for the interview the first time i was like oh okay then <laughs> but then um like whenever i've had a problem like i normally vent my issues on twitter and you've always been the first one to jump in going no no <laughs> <laughs> well you, you know, like the, the sort of, you know, like I know that I suffered, I was never diagnosed and I never went to therapy or anything. When I was a teenager, I definitely was uh, suffering with depression, maybe some bipolar issues, uh, but certainly uh, uh, there was a dark cloud hanging over me for a good long time. Um, and I was very lucky to work my way out of it through art, uh, through acting. Um, it, it became my own therapy and my own way to express mm -hmm. the things that were going on inside of me. And it brought me to a much healthier place as I made my way through my life. Um, you know, you just sort of have to be able to see the things that are right in front of you and sort of be able, you know, comfortable with acknowledging whatever anybody that you happen to be able to sort of connect with uh, is going through and yeah. try to be there and, and be just be a fucking human being a decent human yeah. being. <laughs> it's um funny it's why the reason why I've always loved acting and I still do to this day and because of COVID I've not been able to like join an amateur dramatic society or anything mm. but um I've always loved to just well this is how I knew that there was something wrong with me is that I wanted to be a completely different person I didn't like myself so much that I loved drama so much I could be like oh I'd have to be me I could just be this person yeah <laughs> I, I had a teacher who said once look everybody comes to acting because they think they can escape who they were and then you get in the middle of it and you re realize no I have to reveal who I am through this experience yeah 
Um, and that is a, that's the moment where you turn into, uh, uh, I think, an artist, um, from a performer into an artist. As soon as you start to realize, I am my own pot of gold. I'm not going to get to be anybody but me. And all of these sort of characters are going to be expressions of, of myself. Yeah, um, yeah that is, that's the journey for sure. Yeah, I like that. I actually think that's a really, really good way to end this, to be honest, because I'm. <laughs> it shows me how well like I've prepared myself. Like I'm like, I've got another interview. I've written no questions down, but we'll just see how this goes. Um, but no, thank you. I think that was, it was very nice, really deep. I, I cool. like having a good, deep conversation. Good. Well, it's yeah. my pleasure. And as the world opens back up again, I hope that you'll find some some a drama club or uh, a, a, a oh, company so. to go play with and and uh make sure that yeah because it cannot uh, but help you as a writer as well mm -hmm. absolutely yeah.